David, what was your first job in the entertainment business? My first job in entertainment was a street magician in New York City. I, <laughs> I knew I wanted to be in show business and I wasn't sure how to get into it and I saw somebody else doing it and I thought, well, this looks easy. <laughs> so I went to a magic store and I bought a trick and I created a character and I did a comedy magic. I did a comedic version of a magic trick. And I just stood on the street, had a hat, and it was great training uh, for somebody who wants to go into the comedy business because if I wasn't good, people just walk away. <laughs> Immediate feedback, no waiting for thumbs up or thumbs down or YouTube comments. You knew right away. And it was really, really good training. And I did that for a couple of years. And from there I went into stand-up comedy. I got off the street <laughs> and dropped the magic. Okay, was this your card? You know, I, I uh, dropped the magic, went and started doing comedy clubs and uh, went from there. My second job was stand-up comedian. I toured uh, like 200 colleges doing a one-man show and that was also really good training because they were all over the place. And so it's a great way to develop timing and jokes. And when a joke would bomb, what would you do? How would you get out of it? Oh, I never, never. try to say that with a straight face. <laughs> um, well, you would have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, most of the college audiences were great, so that wasn't a problem. But when you did comedy clubs, you never know what kind of, but you would have uh, a joke ready to talk about if it bombed. If you just acknowledge it, and then the audience, and you acknowledge the reality of it, then the audience laughs, it breaks the tension. Now, this is assuming that the joke before and the joke after doesn't bomb. If you're bombing 100%, I don't, I don't, I don't I actually don't know what that's like. That's not bragging, but that would be, we've all seen that, and that's... That just that's just terrible. <laughs> so you would you would acknowledge when something wasn't working and then almost make fun of it and then move on and that was how you dealt with it. Uh, yeah, if it, it's, I actually wrote a routine about a, where I told a joke that I knew most of the audience wouldn't like, so that I could follow up with four or five jokes about the joke. It sounds kind of meta, and it was, but I would tell it here. I'll tell you the joke. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, here's the joke that most of you won't like, okay? It's a knock-knock joke. I'm gonna do all the parts. I will do all the knock-knock joke parts. Okay, just why. Um, um, knock-knock. Who's there? The t no, I'm, oh, doing, I'm, sorry. I'm doing both the parts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Karen, okay. oh, I'm sorry. security, okay. can we get her out? This so the drunk in the comedy club. Okay. I'm sorry. I will do all the parts. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, let me put my <laughs> Just relax. Back. Okay. I want it to be easy for you. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here's the joke. I'm going to do all the parts of the knock knock joke. Knock knock, the time traveler. Who's there? Knock knock, the time traveler. Who's there? At this point, about a third <laughs> of the audience would get it, and the other two thirds of the audience would turn to them and ask to be explained. Uh, do you get it? No, a lot of people don't get it. Don't feel bad if you don't. Well, the time traveler's moved on to another realm? No. Oh, okay. The then time traveler sure. traveled forward in time uh -huh. to say who was there before you ask who's there. Oh, okay. He traveled in a knock knock, the time traveler. Who's there? He's he moved forward in the joke. That's okay. the, the joke is right, right. the time traveler moved forward in time to the joke. And about a third of the people in the audience loved that joke. <laughs> Okay. And the other third are like you. They're like, you know, they either don't think it's funny or they don't, you know, it's not their thing. But like certain types of audience love it. Like I did it at, uh, I did it at Caltech. They carried me off on their shoulders. Oh, you know, because wow. nerds yeah. love that. You know, it was mm -hmm. like, you know, I got, uh, they named a dorm after me. I mean, it was uh, not really, but that would be nice. And so, and then I did a series of jokes about that joke and about why am I doing a joke that I know people won't like. So it was an entree into my personality of someone being, uh, having a unique point of view and daring to, you know, to start their act that way. So, but that's like meta comedy. It's not observational Seinfeld type things like that. But I learned a long time ago to, when you're quirky, because people who really like that joke like it. It's like when people like certain TV shows or certain characters and they really love them because it speaks to them. And other people are like, how can you like that show? You know, they get passionate about it. But the people who really love it, really love it. Shows like 30 Rock, for example, uh, was never huge in the ratings. 
You know, it was like 90th and stuff in the ratings. It was never big, but the people who liked it, and me included, a really loved 30 Rock, and it stayed on the air because the demographic who watched it was an affluent demographic. Dem, uh, demographic. Uh, it had a huge audience of people who made more than $100,000 a year. So they kept it on the air and ran commercials for those people. Sure. So that's the great thing about the business today is if, you, if you're making a quirky, stupid, time travel, knock knock joke, there's going to be enough of an audience who, who will like that kind of thing because it fits you. You know, it's like when you meet someone, if you're dating and you meet somebody who gets your jokes, it's and gets instant. Your, mm -hmm. You're like, yes. Right. They get me. Right. Yes. So then from New York City, when did you come to Los Angeles? I came to Los Angeles in the 90s. In the 90s. And what was your first entertainment job in the 90s? Uh, AOL, I'm, AOL, circa 1990. Yeah. <laughs> I Dial did, up. I did some acting. I mm -hmm. did uh, commercials, uh, <clears throat> stand-up comedy. I was on Star Search. I did oh. uh, that whole thing, you know, doing that. And then uh, I got into uh, writing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did some acting for a while, and that was fun. I was on uh, the series Working Girl from the movie with Sandra Bullock, and that was uh, before she was Sandra Bullock. You know, I was one of the people, well, a lot of people worked on that show. But uh, so I did things like that, and then I got into uh, writing. When someone asked me, someone had, she was doing a murder mystery dinner theater. She wanted to make a business of doing those yeah. dinner theaters, yeah, and she thought it was cool. a good idea. But she wasn't a writer, and she said, You're funny, would you write this script? And she told me, what the mystery was. She says, okay, this person is going to be guilty and they did it this and that and that and right around that. So I thought, hmm. And I wrote a script and I put in some quirky things that I thought no one would get but me or no one would like but me. Uh, like for example, the detective who comes in. Have, have you ever been to one of these murder mystery things? I have, yeah. yeah you know, they have these characters who come in. So I had a detective come in, like a 1940s detective with a fedora and he came in and he was a you know, case in the room and doing his thing. And I wanted to do a voiceover like they do in all the film noir where like the lead detective, the hard bitten guy, there's a voiceover. And I wanted to do a live voiceover. So I came up with a device where he would do his own voiceover, his own narration. And he would, the device I came up with is he would put his hands on his chin and look up like that. And then he would say, I walked into the room and she had legs up to her or whatever. And, uh, and he did, I thought, That'll never work. And it completely worked. The actor loved doing it. The audience got it immediately. And that was a really good lesson for me is that when you celebrate your own quirkiness, your own unique point of view, uh, it will frequently resonate with the audience. Like in things like, uh, for example, Napoleon Dynamite is nonstop quirkiness all the way through. How many of us are that guy? No one. He's a unique character. But there's little pieces of him that we celebrate. And we recognized it as, it was like, oh, if I had a llama, I'd go feed him lasagna too. I don't know if you remember that scene. But just all these, and he, he's an underdog and people identify with it and it celebrates quirkiness. So I put things like that into my first script. They rehearsed it, they put it on, the audience liked it. And I had two reactions. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It's when you're a writer and you see your work being done for the first time, by good actors and a good production and it works, it's a huge, it's, it's a high. I mean, it's just an amazing feeling because you've been watching entertainment your whole life and now you just made it. And it's, a, it's an amazing feeling. So I had two reactions. That one, which got me hooked to doing it. And the second reaction was, this is easy. <laughs> which well, sadly was not true <laughs> because as you know, it's not easy to make a career of it. But it was enough that I kept doing it.